Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. What is happening? Welcome to Working Hours, a show about a place called Leeds, a time called now, and an activity called work. Working Hours wants to record 1,000 lawyers over the course of this, the most important decade in the history of the human species, and ask them about what they do all day and hear how they feel about it. My mission is to try to map out what my city, Leeds, a city that has declared a climate emergency, is doing during humanity's biggest emergency. On working hours, we hear how loiners have, are, and will be coping with our multiple crises. The global pandemic, Brexit, and of course, the ongoing and accelerating collapsing of capitalism, the state, and the climate through this decade. To do this, I need people, people like you, dear listener. Most of all, I need people who are in Leeds or who are from Leeds to come on this show and be my guests. So please join me and help me with this mission whenever and however you can. Critically, I will need people like you, dear listener, as financial backers. Please consider supporting or donating to this project. You can do so with a £1 monthly donation via either Patreon or Ko-fi, or you could donate any one-off amount to Working Hours via either Ko-fi or through the LibrePay button on the About page of Western Studios website. Thank you. My name is Simon, and this is all my fault. What did you want to be when you grew up? I always wanted to do something creative. I think I knew that. And there was a point where I wanted to be a fashion designer and make clothes and stuff. But then there was a point where I started getting like a little bit older and I was more of a teenager and I was like, well, that's not very practical. I should want to do something practical, like become a teacher or something along those lines. And I started like studying more sciencey stuff in high school. But then I realized I just really don't like that. So I do want to do something creative. And I went back to my original plan. You're listening to Series 3, Episode 49, and to my guest, Josephine Vanna. This is another Zoom interview recorded on the 6th of April, 2022. Hello, loves. So this has been interesting. There were a number of options I could have taken for this episode, but for better or worse, I have chosen a robo-voice option. And it was a fair bit of work, too. So that's why it's late. Very late. Because... My microphone wasn't working. I want to offer sincere apologies to Josephine for this episode, its tardiness, and for my not working microphone during our discussion. So apologies, Josephine. I didn't ask to re-record this interview because you can hear Josephine fine. So, dear listener, don't get thrown too much by my robo voice. I don't think it's going to be taking over as the host of the show anytime soon. Or ever, hopefully. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the novelty and be grateful I didn't use it for this intro. Trad Collective, I'm saying that name wrong, you will find out about that in the episode. Trad Collective was born so people could easily shop for sustainable clothes in Leeds. The idea came from owners Joe and James, who after making a New Year's resolution to only shop sustainably, realised how difficult that actually was to do in Leeds. There were very few options for sustainable fashion that weren't second-hand, and it was hard to find what you were looking for without spending hours going through piles of clothes. They also realised just how much research was needed to find out if brands are actually sustainable or not. So, Joe and James started out selling items from Joe's upcycled clothing brand, Vana Label, and created second-hand clothes in markets around Leeds. From there, they started building connections with other small local brands and began learning what their customers actually wanted and needed. After much careful consideration, they decided to open a shop in Headingley. Combining all the different aspects of sustainability, Trad Collective are a sustainable clothing and lifestyle shop supplying everything from pre-loved to upcycled to responsibly and ethically made items. In their shop in Headingley, Leeds, they have their own in-house studio making their own garments under the Vana label brand, but also offering tailoring services to customers. From mendings to alterations to made-to-order garments, Trad Collective have got you covered. To find out more about Trad Collective, go to tradcollective.com. Right, let's do this. Episode 79 of Working Hours with Josephine Vana. What are you doing now? So, um, 
well, I've got a bachelor in fashion design. So I am technically a fashion designer, I suppose. And we make upcycled clothes in the shop that I've run. So basically it's a sustainable shop. So we make our own upcycled clothes. We do alterations and repairs for customers. And then we also sell secondhand clothes, which we source ourselves, as well as other local sustainable brands and stuff like that. So how did you get into that? How did you set it up? You started with a shop and then went from there. How did it come about? Well, it was a bit of a long process. Like I started my own upcycling brand about two and a half years ago, maybe. Uh, basically right before lockdown. And I started selling my stuff online. But then I quickly realized that like, this is a passion of mine, but it's nothing that I can upscale with the budget that I have enough for it to become like something I can get full time uh, wage out of. So after that, like there was a, quite a long process of me doing little jobs here and there of other things and trying to figure out like, how can I upscale this and how can I keep doing my passion, but actually make it into a, well, a successful business, so to speak. And I thought I can keep doing that, but add other things onto it. So how do I create a sustainable business that's more than what I am doing now? And that's how we sort of came to, well, let's start doing secondhand clothes because that's quite a good seller at the moment. And we can bring in other local brands because that will be less of a cost for us and less time consuming because we don't have to make everything. They will also bring in a lot of other brands, which can be good for a lot of other reasons and et cetera. And we just kind of built onto that idea. And I say we because I run the shop with my partner. He works as a teacher, actually, but he helps out with the shop as well. So I want to look at your experience with sustainable fashion. Did you go to like a sustainable design school? Have you done your own sustainable designs? Or did you start by working with sustainable materials and making clothes with them? Is that how you learned about upcycling? No, I think, well, that was kind of a long thought process for me as well, I think. Because I went to study fashion design in Milan. And which was really cool, to be honest. But the school I went to or the university I went to was very upper classy, let's say. Like, it was basically just a bunch of rich students. And they had a completely different approach to, well, overconsumption and luxury than I was used to, which just made the whole issue with fast fashion and the fashion industry in general a lot more obvious to me than it had been before. So people would just like recklessly overconsume. And that put everything in a completely different light to me. And the school didn't really touch on any sort of sustainability subjects at all, which I also found quite frustrating because they started a fashion business course in London a while before then. And that was very focused on sustainability. And I think I was kind of expecting this to be that as well. And when it wasn't, that was kind of like a little bit of a wake up call for me. I was like, so this is the way the fashion industry is, but it's not what it should be. And do I want to go into the industry like that or do I want to do something different? And I thought, what's the most sustainable way to create clothes? And that, in my opinion, is creating clothes from something that has already been made. And there's so many secondhand clothes about that are still in good condition, but they might not look very modern anymore. So can I use that material and just remake it into something that is actually modern and trendy? And I realized that I could, and it's actually quite interesting as well. It can be very challenging at times, but it's a totally different way to be creative from making a garment from scratch and just having a massive fabric piece that you can do whatever you want with. So did you, did you sort of go into perfecting that before you got to the shop idea? Yes. Were you just selling online? Yeah, I started just selling online. So how did you kind of build up the customer base for that? Just the algorithm found the customers for you? Or how did you build up your customer base for that? Well, that was very slow. Like I think online, well, the way the online world works nowadays, it's really good in very many ways, but it's also highly competitive, especially when it comes to fashion. So 
it was very difficult to create a loyal customer base when you had the whole world to pick from. Um, so I struggled with that. And well, I started my brand when we were living in Austria and then we moved to England. So I didn't even have like a country base. So I think that's also part of the reason why I thought I actually want a brick and mortar store where I can interact with the customers and sort of build a loyal customer base that way. Yeah. So at what point did you become a business? We registered in May last year and then we opened the store in September. So when I registered in May, we started looking at premises and we started exploring like our customer target a bit. We started our Instagram accounts and those kind of things. And we started selling in markets with the plan to sort of have figured some things out by the time we opened the store. And then we found the premises in June, July-ish, I think. And then it obviously took a while for us to actually get the keys and then renovate it because it was completely basically just a shell. Uh, So we opened up second week of September. On the business side, how confident were you with all of that? Well, I would say I was probably pretty confident, but not very experienced. Like, uh, well, I come from a good place when it comes to business, I think, because my dad's got his own company. So he gave us a lot of sort of mental support with that whole side. And he knew how everything works, kind of. I mean, I'm Swedish and his business is in Sweden. But like the gist of it all is similar, even though not everything is the same. So I don't think like we wouldn't have been able to do it without him because we would have just been completely lost. So take us through when you locked down, how that changed your work. Were you working more or less? How easy was it to adapt and sort of pivot what you were doing around the lockdown? Well, I think, I think we were a bit, well, lucky is maybe the wrong word, but our timing was quite good because by the time we opened the store, most of the like big restrictions were already kind of lifted. So we obviously have to wear masks in the store and such, but that's about all that we experienced from when the store opened. And obviously when I was selling my clothes before then, I was doing it all online. So like, I don't think we weren't as affected as many other businesses were. How were you for supplies, donations, that kind of thing for your raw materials? How easy was that to get hold of during lockdown? It's a good question. I suppose that would have been a bit harder to get a hold of. But I'm a bit of a material hoarder, so I already had lots of materials. Um, and I think it would have been really difficult for us to source the secondhand stock if we would have done that whole bit in lockdown. But as I say, like luckily, most restrictions were reasonably lifted by the time we opened. So like when we went to get stock, we were only allowed to be two people that did that. And those kind of things, but everything was sort of possible, just a bit more difficult, I suppose. Were you working more or less then? Did work slow down, speed up, or did it sort of dip and then kind of start to restore? How was it? I think it was quite like even in the beginning. Because we had, well, I suppose it went up and down, but it's hard to say like if it went up and down because of COVID or just because of, I don't know, weather people's financial situations like it's always a bit tricky to evaluate and because there was no actual lockdown like I I wouldn't be able to tell you if it was due to COVID or not I didn't know I suppose I was a little bit nervous that we would head into another lockdown because I mean the way the government was handling it all like you never knew what was going to happen but equally I think at the end of a big crisis like COVID there's always a bit of a like uphill because people are more excited about actually coming out and doing things. And I thought this is a good opportunity for us. COVID hits again, we're screwed. But if it doesn't, we're actually in a really good position. So, I mean, we were definitely a bit lucky there, but I think we did open up at the right time. Do you have people help you with your stuff? Do you have other designers? Yeah, so we've got one employee and... Hopefully we'll try and hire a second one soon. And she helps out mainly with the alterations, but she also does a lot of the upcycling where we get, well, basically the alteration and mendings for customers take up a lot of our time. So that's always our 
first priority. And then when we have a little bit of time left over, that's when we make the upcycle stuff. So in an ideal world, we'd have one person that focuses entirely on the alterations, which is why it was higher a second person. And then me and our current employee can focus on the upcycling things. Um, but yeah, she helps out a lot. And then it's me. You mentioned that you normally have quite a lot of material around. How do you manage your stock levels? Did you always keep a massive amount of surplus? How does managing material work for you time-wise? How do you make sure you're producing enough material that you are producing surplus so you can actually make money? I think I'm still trying to figure that one out. Obviously, we always try to have something in the shop, but we don't have a lot of extra space. Like our back room's very tiny and like we obviously just can't keep loads of extra material because we also have to keep some of the extra stock for the already made clothes that we're selling, like the secondhand stock. So like we try to keep the materials we need at a minimum kind of, um, but then also we want to have material for when we actually do need to upcycle. So at the moment, we have a lot of secondhand shirts that we are planning to upcycle but not that much else. And then we get a lot of scrap bits from the alterations we make. Like if we hem someone's trousers, there will always be like a little bit of extra scrap that we keep that we can kind of use for other repairs or patching things. So that works out quite well with whole alteration repair bits, whereas the upcycling bit is a bit more of a guessing game, like how much stock can we actually fit now? Or do we need to make more stuff so that we can get them out of the rack and clear out the back room a little bit? Like, we just wing it at this point. I suppose that's going to be a key issue for you because from the sustainability point of view, you're recovering all the material you can from landfill, potentially. But you can't just have endless bits of cloth hanging around because you've got to put it somewhere. And if you're putting it somewhere that's not in your house, then you're having to pay for that space. Or if it's in the shop, then it's obviously taking up floor space, which could be used for sales. So I would imagine that's a constant struggle for you of how much you keep and what you throw away. What's the resolution that you've found at the moment? Well, I don't know. Like, as I say, we've got all the secondhand stock that's not been washed yet at home, which is not really ideal because that means that there's always a lot of clothes in our house. But that's just because that's the easiest way we've figured out to actually wash it. In an ideal world, we would rent a space or have extra backroom space where we could actually do it in the shop or somewhere else. But at the moment, this is it. And I don't know, it's a bit tricky. Like, we don't throw things away because one, it's not sustainable. And two, I always think that I can find some use for it. But at one point, there will obviously be too much things and we will have to figure out what to do with them. We just haven't really gotten there yet. Would it be opening a second shop? Maybe, yeah. Um, I think, like, hopefully if things go well, like, we would like to open a second shop or potentially move into a bigger space. Like, either one of those options would work out well. Because, um, I mean, the way it works with the upcycling for us does already work reasonably well because the second hand clothes that we don't sell or that don't sell, like, if they've been on the racks for a while, we just take them and upcycle them instead. Yeah. Or if we accidentally buy something secondhand that's already got a hole or something in it, we'll upcycle it instead. Um, and if we have a lot of extra shirts that we are planning to upcycle, but we don't really have time to upcycle them at all, we can always sell them as secondhand clothes instead. So there's quite a good, well, circular thing going on with those things already. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's just one of those things like, We've not been open long enough for me to have found the perfect solution for it, you know? Yeah. So are you at the point where you've broke even? Almost, yeah. We've had a few good months now in summertime, which I think was really well because we were worried because we're in Headingley and we were really worried that summer was going to be slow because of all the students being gone when it's actually been the opposite. So we really sort of can breathe out now because that kind of feels like, okay, if it's going this well now in summertime when there's no students. It can only get better when the students get back, fingers crossed. Um, but we are starting to break even. Yeah, good. That's your main struggle initially. Yes. Uh, I do think, like both from a business point of view and from a customer point of view, that the alteration service was a really good decision. Because it is, as you say, like you get loyal customers in a different way when they come in for a service as well as buying products. And it is very sustainable and it does bring a lot about to the 
circular economy sort of thing. Um, but it is also very time consuming. So it's a bit tricky to figure out how to how to manage it in a good way if it was to expand. Because at the moment, we already have about the maximum amount of alterations in as me and my employee can handle. So if we were to get more in, how do we handle it? Like, would we have an extra employee working in store? Would we outsource it somewhere? Like, it's all a bit of a big question mark at the moment and how it would expand or could potentially expand. But as I say, I do think it's a great service to provide. And I think even if there are alterations places about, like, there's not a lot of alteration places about that aren't dry cleaners. And you might not feel, well, have the same trust towards a dry cleaner to alter your clothes as you would if you go into a place and you can actually chat to the designer that makes the alterations. So you can try them on, it will pin them on you and make sure that everything fits well. Like, I think you get a different kind of service with us than you would at a dry cleaner's. I suppose from a sustainability point of view, it's a question of how much profit do I want? At what point am I just creating more impact than I'm saving? So that must be quite a hard calculation to make. I mean, have you done a lot of sustainability training or is it just something that you're very interested in? Yeah, I've not done much training at all. It's just kind of built up with time and done a bit of research and stuff as well, I suppose, but like, that's it. But yeah, the pricing is very tricky. Because it's, yes, you say, like, I obviously want us to make a profit, but equally, I want us to be affordable. Like, I want people to be able to come in and alter their clothes, because otherwise, if they can't afford to alter them, are we actually that sustainable? But then we also need to pay ourselves a living wage, because that is also one type of sustainability, you know? So there's so many different aspects that you have to think about all the time. So, I want to look at Brexit next. Has Brexit altered your work at all that you've noticed? Not too much. I mean, I will say that Brexit is a massive pain, but it's not really altered the way we run the store much because it is, as you say, like we source most things locally anyways, or all things basically. Um, but it has meant that I've had to take, because I sold my upcycled clothes on a few European platforms before that I had to stop doing because shipping it from here is just costly and very complicated and time consuming. So that bit has changed, but it's not made that big an impact anyways, you know? I think it's all a matter of adapting the right way. Like obviously in some ways it might've been good to be able to reach non-English markets and sell to other countries, but equally like England is big enough for us to make a profit from just selling to English people, you know? So I think it's fine. What can you do in your work to mitigate, adapt to, or raise awareness about climate change? Well, that's something that we're working on a bit as well, I think, because we want to raise more awareness about sustainability. But like, we're not really doing as much as I would like to at the moment, because I think that's something you have to thread a bit carefully about like how do you raise awareness without becoming preachy because the second you become preachy customers get quite annoyed and they might stop listening to you altogether. so I'm struggling on how to figure out a way to be informative and like engaging whilst not being too much you know and I still haven't figured out a perfect way to do that are you still doing all your marketing Yes. What do you feel you have done already? Obviously, you're recovering items from going to landfill. Do you feel that you're, what am I trying to get at here? Do you feel that you're doing your bit already? Not really. I mean, I'm doing some bits, but I could and I would want to do more. And I feel like that's, that's where the marketing comes in again. And I'm a bit like, a bit unexperienced in the marketing field, which is why I'm threading a bit carefully. Um, so... Like I think, because we have a bit of signage and stuff up in the store that explains a little bit about most of the brands that we stock and why they're sustainable and why what they're doing. And I think that's a good start, but I would like probably more similar signage and such explaining like sustainability this and sustainability that. Because I think that would be a good sort of 
soft way to increase awareness. Like people can read the signs if they want to, but they're not forced to read them, if that makes sense. Do you feel that you're doing something though? Do you know what volume of material you have saved from landfill? Obviously, it's an assumption that it's going to go to landfill or that it could have gone to a secondhand store and been used again. But ultimately, it's going to go there and you are extending the life of it. I mean, I would, if I was you and I was doing what you are doing, I would have a thing of like this many kilograms of clothes saved. So do you have that kind of data? Do you have a calculation already for this material and this thread? Like, do you have anything like that already in place or is it all? Yeah. Are you calculating that, I suppose? Well, we're kind of working on that, actually, because since we're almost a year old now, we thought it would be good to have a bit of that kind of data to say, like, in this first year, we have saved this and that amount. And especially with the repairs and alterations, because I think it is, as you say, like, it's very sort of hypothetical if it will actually end up in landfill or not, especially with secondhand clothes, but with the clothes that people already have that are ripped or have some sort of mending that needs doing, like they will very likely not go to a secondhand shop or a charity shop because they're broken. So by us mending that, like I think it's quite clear that we can say that we've extended the lifespan of that item. So I think that data is a bit more accurate, let's say, than saying that we've saved this much secondhand clothes from landfill because they might just end it up somewhere else. I suppose with climate change, there are other things to consider, you know, deliveries, but then you've got the shop for people to pick things up. And then from a kind of a community building side, you get people to shop local and so on and, and build relationships. Do you think that people when they're buying, say an upcycled item or they have an alteration done, do you think they have a different relationship with that item of clothing than they would to something that's mass produced? Yeah, in a way. Like a lot of the things we alter are still clothes that have been made by fast fashion brands, which in itself isn't really good. But the fact that the customer wants to hold on to it a bit, li little bit longer, I think is very good because that speaks to the opposite of overconsumption. Like you can buy a fast fashion item and if it lasts you 10 years, then that's great. Um, so I think, like I think in a way that does increase the awareness of prolonging and a garment's lifespan a little bit for the customers. And just the fact, like we get a lot of customers that come in and they go, oh, you do alterations. Well, actually, I've got things in my closet that I could get altered. And they haven't even really thought of it before they've seen our sign. So I think in that way, it definitely changes people's mindset a little bit. When you upcycle, do you improve the robustness of anything? Say it is a fast fashion item and maybe the stitching's a little bit weak on it. And then you come in and you make it more sturdy. If needed, yes. Um, I mean, there's only so much you can do. Because it is, as you say, like the stitching's easy to sort of make a little bit stronger. But the issue is usually the quality of the materials. Like they're quite weak and thin. And like the actual fabric fibers will eventually sort of just create holes and there's not that much we can do like even if we mend one hole another one will appear you know so like the things we upcycle we try to upcycle already really good quality things because we obviously want to sell clothes that actually last and same thing with the second hand clothes that we do source like we try and source good quality things and mm, a minimal amount of non-natural fibers which can be a bit tricky but like, I think, I mean, it's important to teach people as well that, like, there's a difference in material and quality, which I think a lot of people haven't really realized yet, because it's not something that you necessarily see in fast fashion brands, because everything they make is poor quality. And that's why it is so cheap. I'm thinking there as well about the history of leads. Does any of that sort of play into your thinking or even your marketing of like... The history of Leeds is an industrial city that produced a lot of material and being historically a market town for wool and so on. Do you play into any of that heritage at all? Don't really, but you do have a good point, actually. Because um, I haven't explored that much at all. Like, I, I barely even knew Leeds existed before I moved here, to be honest. No, as to everyone in Leeds, I do love it here now. But as a Swede, like, you never hear anything about Leeds. You know, about Manchester and London and that's it, kind of. Maybe Birmingham. Yes, you're lucky. Um, but yeah, you do have a good point there because it is, as you say, Leeds has quite a strong heritage in textiles. It could be interesting to explore. 
How does it work for you tension-wise between your business needs and your own need to be sustainable? Again, it's that tension between how much work are you doing? What's an affordable amount to charge people? What's excessive? What should my margin be like? Is that a constant battle for you or do you think you've got a handle on it? Uh, I'd... It's very tricky, to be honest, because I think because sustainability is still a reasonably new concept and because fast fashion is so cheap, like it's hard to convince people or make them understand that like what we're selling new sustainable clothes for isn't actually that expensive. It's more that fast fashion is unreasonably cheap. So like that sort of balance is very tricky to teach the customer. And like, as you say, we don't want to be too expensive because then we'll lose customers as well. But obviously we need to be at a sustainable price point. And I think sustainability and price isn't really necessarily someone that something that people has understood yet, if that makes sense. So our margins are quite possibly or very possibly a little bit lower than they need to be in the future for us to expand at the rate we need to. Obviously, you've got potential to expand, but it's how that happens for you. As you get bigger, the pressure on you to increase your profits would grow. And obviously, there's the actual business reality of, I've got to pay for more things and I've got to make sure the money's there to pay for those things. But also, as your profits increase, demand increases. So maybe there is more market pressure now for you to raise your prices. And obviously, as you're earning more money, you're enjoying more money. So all that pressure kicks in. And then there's the danger of not being sustainable anymore. Is that something that's in your mind? A bit, yeah. Like, it is a very tricky balance to like, be both sustainable and profitable. It is something I still haven't figured out. So get back to me in like a year or two and we'll see that. So social media is taking over more and more of our lives. More of us spend time on it. More of us have to do it for work. So for you, in terms of the amount of work you have to do on social media, do you feel that that time invested is returned? Is it a really good return on investment or do you feel that you're just throwing things into the ether and you've no idea what's happening and it takes up too much of your time and you could just do without it? It's definitely the second one, Dave. Just, I, I, like, uh, social media is just such a struggle and it's so time consuming. It drives me mad. Like, it's one of those things that I know I have to do, so I do it, but I don't get it. Do you look at your stats? Do you check your numbers all the time to see if they're growing or are you just like, I don't care, I don't want to know, it's just something else to worry about? It depends. Like on occasion, I'll look and I'll research and I'll try new things and sort of think, yes, now, now, now this is my week. I'm going to do really well this week and I'll keep track of everything. But then the next week, I'm just so fed up with it and I'm like, this is causing me so much bother. I just can't look at you right now and I'll just leave it. So that's probably why we're struggling a bit as well, because I'm not consistent with like our social media posts at all, because it just goes up and down. It's like, it depends on how much I can handle that week, basically. Are you making yourself the face of your brand or are you like automatically, I don't want to be that, like, I don't want to come across as vain? Yeah, kind of. Like, I, I've never liked being in front of the camera. Like, I'm not photogenic at all. But then I was also at the point where like, who else is going to be in front of the camera? It's just me here, so I have to do it, even though I don't really want to, and it makes me a little bit uncomfortable. But yeah, I've kind of accidentally become the face of my company because I'm the only one there doing it. Well, you have to. You are the company. It wouldn't exist as a thing if it wasn't for you. You brought it into being. That's the whole thing of starting a business, isn't it? It's that thing of, you know, artists and entrepreneur like, you know, I want to just create. Okay, but what are you going to do with all of these creations? Are you just going to fill up a space with all the things you've created? Or are you going to try and get it to people? Yeah, it's, it's just a tricky one though. Do you have a preferred outlet, a preferred platform? I would imagine being a fashion company, Instagram is the way forward. Yeah, yeah, definitely. We basically only use Instagram. Like it's connected to Facebook, so it does technically upload the posts on Facebook automatically, but we don't really focus much on it. I think... Well, James has done a bit of Facebook marketing and sort of posted in local Facebook groups, which usually works out quite well. But 
I think Instagram is definitely our place to be just because it's us. You say we're a fashion company and people look for visual content. That's what they want from us. Are you on TikTok? No. I've had multiple mm. people tell me that I should be. It's visual, but it's who is going to be your star, who's going to be the model. When you're talking about bringing another person into the shop, maybe to do alterations, how far down the road do you see a marketing person coming in? Or would you ever just farm it out? Have you considered getting a social media manager to do the work for you or do you want to keep control of it? Well, I've thought of it. I'm definitely a little bit of a control freak though. So I think I'd struggle to let go of it. But as, as, as I've told you, I don't like doing it that much. So I think at some point when it starts going well and we can actually afford it, like it would be a good idea to have someone like to do at least part of it. But then as it is now, like we can't afford to spend money on someone doing that instead of the alterations because the alterations are more important. Yeah, that spend is better generating an immediate income that then a social media person might bring in lots of new work, but it's only you and your partner to do the work. Yeah, you think that reaching more people automatically gets you sales, but it is hit and miss. You know, you can't necessarily see. Some people can. When I speak to some people, they're like, absolutely, there wouldn't be a business without the social media side. But if you can't see that connection, it's kind of like, why am I spending time doing this irritating thing and not on what I actually do? Yeah, yeah, I think it's more like the alterations is a very immediate problem. Like if we don't have someone doing alterations, we'll have upset customers right now. Whereas social media and growth is very much a sort of future potential thing. Like it will be good for the future, but right now the alterations and our upset customers are more important kind of, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, that goes back to that locality thing as well. You know, you as a sustainable business, you want your customers to be as local as possible and as happy as possible. Mm. So, you know, from the social media side of things, yeah, it might alert people who live locally and remind them about the shop. But it's not like you need to reach, you know, the other side of the world because then you've got the whole shipping thing there. Okay, moving on. So, if there was a universal basic income, so if you were getting enough to live every month, all your bills and basic costs covered, would you still work? If you would still work, would you still be doing this? And if you were still doing this, would you be doing it in the same way? Yeah, I'd say yes to all of it. Like, running a business is hard, but I love it. Like, even the boring bits, like social media, like, I love you love as well. Like, I find all the different aspects of the business and the fact that I'm in charge and have control over it all very thrilling. I can just change the business however I like, whenever I like. I have that power and that makes me feel very satisfied about my job. Even if it is really difficult at times as well. So, yeah, no, I wouldn't change it. How do you think it would have affected the business? I mean, would you do as many hours? Obviously, as a business owner, you will have gone through points where, especially at the beginning, money was a worry. Like, am I going to have enough? How am I going to pay for this? How am I going to stretch that? Like, I need this much money now. Where is it going to come from? From that side of things. If you had a UBI there paying your bills and so on, do you think it would have? I mean, obviously it would change things. But how do you think it would have affected your focus? What would you have focused on? Would you have got the shop sooner, for example? I don't know. I think if all of that was sort of sorted for me, that would potentially have shifted my motivation a little bit. Because now the fact that I had to work really hard to get to the point where we need to be is a big motivator. And I think if I didn't necessarily have that one, that would potentially make me a bit lazier. We're not like, I, I wouldn't have that extra push or drive to do the things that needed to get done, if that makes sense. But then that might also have meant that I could have more time to do things such as upcycling and we would be able to sell more of our own clothes and I could focus on, I don't know, optimizing the space or doing social media. I'm thinking potentially customers would have more money. Maybe they might not spend as much as often, but maybe you could charge more for it and then maybe spend more time on the items. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That could definitely be one. That would be good, to be honest, if that was possible. Yeah, I mean, I haven't really touched on that yet. Are you, are you quite the workaholic? Like, are you able to separate? I mean, obviously you've got, you work in your home and you know, you've got stuff to be restored all over the place. But can you separate those worlds? 
or is there no distinction between working life for you at the moment? Is it working everywhere all the time? No, I think I try to make a distinction because I think that's very important to my stress level. Like I handle my stress level quite well, but it does sometimes get a bit too much. So, well, we do have the stock at home. So we do have to wash it, but that's like a different kind of work. But besides that, like I try and do everything at the store. And when I leave the store, I just go home and I don't work. Then that means that I sometimes stay in the store a little bit later. But I have the distinction of like the place where I work and where I relax. And I think that helps a lot. Okay, last question. So if you could change any three things about your work, anything at all, you can go fantasy, you can be practical. If you could change any three things about your work right now, what would they be? I would have a bigger back room, definitely. I think it also, I'm not sure how to formulate this in a good work, work way, uh, but I'd like to have the ability to work less if I wanted to. Like, if I only wanted to go in two days a week, like I would want to be able to because there would be someone else covering the store for me, kind of. I think I'd like a bigger storefront as well. Like, just a bigger store in general, both front and back. That would be nice. I mean, do you find that Headingley is a really good placement for the shop? I mean, if you were going to have a second shop, where else do you think would be good? Hmm. Well, to answer the first question, I do think Headingley is a good place for us. Mm. Um, we did start out looking in the city centre because we thought, well, that's where the people are, we're in the centre. Uh, but as for our first store, I'm actually really happy we didn't go with that because I think in Headingley we get much more of a local customer base which makes it easier to get loyal customers. And I don't think that would have worked the same way in the city center and the alterations and repair service wouldn't have worked the same way either. Headingley was a really good start. But as for the second shop, I would definitely consider getting one in the city center because now we've gotten our customer base sorted already and we could adjust and adapt the store a bit to sort of fit the city center vibe more and maybe focus more on the clothes we sell and the upcycle things in the city center rather than the alterations and repairs. And I think we'd probably do that there as well, but I'd expect that to be less popular in the city center than it is in Henningway. How about market stalls? They're quite cheap. Yeah, market stalls are quite cheap and it's definitely a good way to start out. Like a lot of the uh, small brands that sell with us, they do a lot of markets. But they're very much a hit and miss. Like some markets are really good and they sell quite well and some markets are completely dead. So you kind of have to be prepared for that. I enjoyed starting out in markets, but I don't really necessarily want to go back. I'm kind of done with my questions, so I'll pass over to you. Is there anything that you want to mention or talk about that we haven't covered yet? If not, give us your socials and your sales pitch. Oh, well, I'm not really good at sales. <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> So that's really stupid asking how to shop, but I was always more of a soft sell than a hard sell kind of person. Um, so no, I, I don't think so. Like in general, I just would like to say that I'm really happy with what I do. And I am really happy that we have so many loyal customers and that people of Headingley have sort of embraced our shop the way they have. Um, it's not really anything related to sales pitches, but that's my general feeling at the moment. Excellent. So where can people find you? So we're in Headingley Central, which is the Arndale Centre, in between Costa and Greggs. I meant online. Well, our, all our socials is Trad Collective LCD. That's T-R-A-D Collective. Uh, and our website is tradcollective.com. What is the name? So Trad, well, Stewood is the actual name. It means thread in Swedish. I was trying to figure out what to name the store and I wanted it to be something Swedish to sort of yeah. touch point on the fact that I am Swedish and everything we do in the shop kind of reflects the Swedish Scandi vibe a little bit. And I think living in England as a Swede, I've become more proud of being Swedish, I suppose. So I, I just wanted the store to be as Swedish as I feel, kind of. And well, still it makes a lot of sense to name a shop that has to do with fashion. And there's that heritage again as well, the connection between Scandinavia and Northern England. 
Have you been open long enough that you know your business patterns through the year? Is it kind of steady or are you still finding that out? I think I'm still finding it out just because, like, as I said, we've had a really good summer. And so I think that now we're at a point where we need to be. But in the beginning, we weren't. So it's very hard to sort of make any good evaluations about how we started out before where we're at now, where we're kind of breaking even, you know? So, like, I know that we shouldn't go back where we were, but... Like, I think a year from now, I'll have a much better idea of how how it all works and how the sales sort of go up and down and when they're steady and when they're not, kind of. Yeah. Have you done a winter already with the shop? Yeah, yeah, we did last winter. So are you worried about price increases for heating, fuel and so on, like running cost for the shop? I don't know about commercial rents, but is that a concern? I don't think that concerns me as much as customers' behaviour concern me because I'm worried that customers will start spending less obviously because of everything going on but as for our own costs like the rent won't change and the electricity will go up a bit but we don't have any heaters uh, because we're in between Costa and Greg so they're basically just giving us the heat we need kind of so we don't really have that much electricity sort of going out and we don't use that much water either because we're not really like we make coffee, but we're not really handling anything else. Um, obviously, the water bill here where we do the washing will go up a bit, but I think it will affect us, but less than it will affect bigger companies. Yeah, ideally, I would have gone to the shop before I spoke to you. I've seen the shop. I know it's not a massive space, but do you have to kind of fill the walls with stock or is it? Do you leave it quite spacious? Well, I think. My original vision is very different from what the store looks like now. Yeah. So basically, like when we got there, it was the walls were already sort of white and plastered and everything. So that was all done. Uh, but other than that, it was basically just a big hole. And I was like, okay, I want it to be nice and spacious and airy and not too much, not too cluttered. Um, but when we started out, we had all the rocks along the walls. And two tables in the middle, I think. And that was it. And I thought that looked really nice because there was so much space. But I think that was a bit intimidating for customers because they came in expecting it to be a lot more expensive than it was. People were getting the impression of it being elite, like one of those shops in, I don't know, Victoria Quarter or something with just one jumper for sale. Exactly. And I hadn't really thought of that. Like, I hadn't thought of it from the customer's point of view. I just thought it would be really nice with lots of space and it will look so pretty. Mm. But then once it started happening, I was like, oh, yeah, this actually does make sense. It is a bit intimidating. And like, you, as soon as you entered the shop, like, you straight away saw us working there. Mm. So, like, you felt maybe a bit too intimate with the staff as well. Whereas you might want to browse and feel like you're in your own space and there's not someone watching you. And that was kind of lacking in the beginning. So we slowly had to build on that and make more racks. And as we made more racks and filled up with more stock, obviously we sold more because there was more. So that was sort of a learning curve for me that I I wouldn't have known before we opened. Yeah, I imagine as a new business starting out, you would have done some of these networking events and you'll have done some marketing training because you will have had to. So did you have your ideal customer in mind? Did you have a number of ideal customers in mind or were you thinking, well, it's just me and the target market and work off that? Were you mapping the customer journey? Like how far have you got with that kind of stuff? Or was it just, I have an idea of the shop. I want the shop. Oh, people want the shop different. I've made the shop different. Well, I think, I did have a rough idea of like our target customer and things like that. But then I actually discussed this with one of the other business owners around a few weeks ago. And we were saying that like, you can have a very clear idea of who you want your customer to be. But then once you open the door, it might be something completely different. And I think Headingly is quite unique that way because it's got such a big variety of age groups. Like there is a lot of students and there's a lot of young professionals and there's a lot of middle-aged, middle-class people and they all come to the shop and they all like it and they all like it in different ways. Like the 
students will sort of stray more towards the secondhand clothes and the young professionals will like the upcycle things more because it's more unique and the middle-aged people will use the alteration service more because they've had their clothes for a long time and they want to keep having them so like we can't just focus on one customer group which also would probably make someone working in marketing really frustrated with me for saying but I don't have one target customer I have three or four like you said, without the experience of selling a thing to a person you're like, I don't know who'd buy this. Yeah, now I know. Now they've bought it. Now I know who would buy it. Them. Yeah, because I think that you also get a special sort of insight from running shop in that way than you would online because you see the people and you interact with them. And people around here are very chatty, so you usually talk quite a lot with them. And like you get to know your customer in a completely different way than you would online, which I think is invaluable because like, we wouldn't be able to understand the customers the way we do today if we were an online business. If you grew, would you miss that part of it? You've said you like the ability to interact directly with people who are buying your work. I know you've got the business, you're doing all of these other things, but ultimately, do you still want to do your own works? The work that you started out doing, is that what you really want to do and keep doing? How would you feel about moving away from that and being more office-based, paper-based, not really interacting with the customers, not really doing the work that you set out to do? Would you want to walk away? I don't think I would like it. Like, I don't think I would walk away from this, but even if we did grow and I would have to be in an office occasionally, I would still want to do this part of the business just because, as I said, like, you do interact with the customers and you learn a lot about what they want and what they need and what they feel. And I wouldn't be able to learn that in an office. And even if my staff that works in the shop might tell me, like, it's not the same. And I think as the founder, director, whatever you want to call me, like, I should be the one getting those experiences. Then other people can work in the offices, like the social media managers, marketing, whatever. They could all do the office bit, but I don't really have to. So I wouldn't want to. Yeah, I got that impression from you as well. So when you are upcycling something, is it purely just material and stitching or are you working with dye or colouring or do you have to treat any of the material in any way? No, we don't. Um, I would like to get into natural dyes because I think that's really interesting and quite fun. Uh, but then again, I would need to do it somewhere where I actually have access to water and a washing machine and whatnot, which would be at home, which will make our home even messier than it already is. So that's kind of on the waiting list for now but um other than that we don't treat the materials like we pick materials which we think will look good the way they are so we wash them but that's it would you have events in the shop do you have events in your shop because you could potentially as another product line maybe like sewing classes upcycle classes events where you have speakers on sustainability or so on like i don't know how the shop is arranged I don't know how easy it would be to hold an event in the space, but that's kind of a common thing. Is there anything that you've considered or that you've done? Um, yes, we've actually just started doing it. I've, I've got a workshop on tonight because um, a woman that does embroidery, she approached me actually and she wanted to do workshop and she does workshops in Terminus in Meanwood as well. So this will be her second workshop at ours. And... I think, because I would like to do sewing workshops myself or have like weekly classes where people sort of come and continue doing their projects, but they don't have to come every week. Um, so I'm sort of figuring out the gist of it. And she's above a trial run to see how the space works out, how people are responding to it, to see if there is a bit of a market sort of for it and then I would like to start doing it myself. So you know, we've got this school uniform recycling, school uniform exchange. Leeds again has a big history of making uniforms with buttons and they'll be a big driver of consumption. I imagine you don't get uniforms in the shop, but is there space or scope for kind of bringing circular design, circular consumption into uniforms and adapting uniforms and maybe even upcycling existing uniforms? Like is that something that could be explored or is there any potential there? Potentially. It's an interesting question, actually, because uniform is such a big deal and big topic. Um, 
it could definitely be something we'd look into in the future. Like at the moment, we're not doing children's wear at all. So we'd sort of become a new, well, part of the business, so to speak. But it would be interesting, definitely. Do you think, again, going back to your sort of design experience and passion, how easy is it to create? Sort of what I'm trying to get to is I'm thinking in my head, like, what what is the design? What's the key design of like? You design an element that you can constantly upcycle and ideally one that you can say like a, like a baby grow that stays with you your entire life. So I'm thinking, is there like a modular design, you know, with modular design sports stuff like this is the main element, sort of take that out, put a new one in there. But the thing itself, the entire thing doesn't have to be replaced over the time. And so in terms of longevity and so on, like other than the upcycling, have you done any designs where you're like, okay, so this is a design that your item needs to be doing. So just want to get you to talk on that a little bit. Well, that's something that I'm constantly working on because I do find that very interesting. And like, how do you keep a garment interesting for longer? Like what makes the customer want to keep it for longer? And we try to make, um, first of all, adjustable garments which can be a bit tricky because obviously like whenever you make something adjustable, that obviously changes the fit of things. So it might not be as fitting as it would if it wasn't adjustable. But I am constantly working on designs to perfect them that way. Um, like we make wrap skirts, which you can technically sort of adjust and it won't alter the shape too much. And we make quite a few tops that are open in the box. So they will just strap the back instead. Whereas you can adjust the straps to fit your size. At, but it only works so far. Like it can work in between two sizes, but more than that, like it won't actually fit you that well because that's just not how construction of a garment works. And then we also try and make reversible things so that you can wear them both sides. So that will technically be two garments in one. So I am trying to like figure out ways to do what you talked about, but is, as I say, tricky. It requires a lot more thinking than just making a normal garment. That's the ultimate problem, isn't it, of sustainable fashion. But then there's so much to it. There's fast fashion and then there's the necessity of clothes, the utilitarian aspect of being warm, staying cool and covering up. So yeah, there is no one size fits all for it. No, that's it. There isn't. And I don't think there's a perfect solution for this problem because, I mean, as you say, there's so many different aspects that has to sort of fit into it. You know, when you hit your teenage years, like, it's potentially better now. But it's like you go from kids' clothes to no clothes, basically. Because you're not kids, you're not adults. They're not really making anything in any particular size for you anymore. And everyone grows at very different rates. So finding clothes becomes really difficult. Do you find a lot of your work is just taking something that's standardized and then making it more personalized? Yeah. Yeah, a lot. Especially, we get a lot of wastes. Because people will buy a pair of trousers and they will fit them really well, like the hips and thighs, but they'll be too big in the waist. That's a very common alteration we do. Because especially with women, like their curves will be very different from person to person. And big browns will just have one size for it. Whereas that's not really how it works in reality. So yeah, I think again, like sizing is a very tricky one. Like, it's impossible to get the sizing right because of that. Like, in an ideal world, there'll be 40 different sizes instead of 5 or 10 or whatever. Or everyone would be getting their clothes made personally and locally. Yeah, yeah. Or they could just get them altered with us and we'll solve our problem for them. Thank you again to Josephine for being my guest. Thanks again to all my guests. And thanks to you, Leeds, for being my subject. And of course, most of all, thank you to you my dear listener. I hope the robot voice wasn't too off-putting. There should be an accompanying episode, either dropping with or just after this episode, and Series 4 will finally start next week. I know I haven't done a rant for a bit, and today is the anniversary of another mass human rights atrocity, but as we soon won't have any such rights ourselves, Let's not talk about any of that for now, eh? All the shit in our drinking water, the Turkey-Syria earthquake, the ongoing strikes, the food shortages, the mushroom cloud in Palestine, Ohio. Just, let's just leave all that to one side for now. We do have a podcast series to get finished. 
I still need listeners. I still need guests. I still need financial support via donations or memberships to sustain and develop this project. Loiners, help me. You can follow this show on Twitter at Working Hours 3 and on Instagram at Working Hours Pod Leads. Use the hashtag Working Hours Pod Leads to stay up to date on when new episodes are being released, to DM me with your questions, or most importantly, to get in touch if you'd like to be my guest on this show. Please do chuck in anything you can to help the show grow. Go to ko-fi.com forward slash working hours and join me there for a pound a month or you can make a one-off donation of whatever amount. Uh, You can also go to patreon.com forward slash working hours pod to support working hours, again, from as little as a pound a month. Why not be super awesome and join both? Do something new and something different. Remember to like, share, follow, and subscribe to Working Hours. That's me. Cheers, ears. Take care out there and be kind to each other, leads. Working Hours is produced, recorded, edited and published by Simon Treen for Western Studios Leeds Limited. The music was The Bees from Chopin's Etudes, which is in the public domain and was taken from museopen.org. Please like Western Studios Leeds on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash western underscore studios underscore Leeds and on LinkedIn linkedin.com forward slash company forward slash western hyphen studios. Leads, are you considering taking the plunge into podcasts or audio content? Then think Western Studios for support, advice and guidance on getting it made. At Western Studios, you work with a real life learner who is actually in Leeds. Not a piece of software, not a course of articles or a series of live chats and video courses, but me, a person in physical place-based reality. If you want to work with me to make your podcast or any digital audio content in Leeds, whether it's for your own cause, your publicity campaigns, to promote your products, increase your sales, or just to create your own passion projects, then get in touch with me, Western Studios, now. Don't wade through vapid articles and videos and podcasts about how to make podcasts by disembodied virtual people on the web. Get on with making your podcast now, and then when it gets hard and expensive and it all goes wrong, which it will, then call Western Studios to make your podcast with you or even for you. Western Studios will take on your podcast boring, time-consuming and painful admin, recording, editing, transcription, whatever. Tell me about your podcasting pain points and I can make it all better for you. I feel your pain. For a charge, I will share it. Remember, podcast work is work. Leeds businesses, Leeds campaigns, Leeds brands. Got an inkling that you'd like a podcast but don't know where to start? Contact Western Studios at makemypodcast at western-studios.com and we'll start making your podcast straight away. The first hour of arranged consultation and pre-production time is free. £25 an hour after that for editing, recording, production. I can also arrange hefty discounts for the right projects. So tell me your idea and your budget and I'll tell you what I can do for you. What do you have to lose? Time, that's what. Time is running out. The best time to make a podcast was 10 years ago. The second best time is right now. Writers in Yorkshire, what are you doing with your lives? Hopefully you're writing. Well, I know there are listeners out there who want to hear great original writing performed as audio content that is about and for and has been made in Leeds. How do I know this? because I'm one of them loiners what wants it. Help me make your old screenplays, unpublished novels, unperformed plays, stories, poems, and performances, whatever you got, baby, and make it as podcast content. Is your work arty, salacious, pulpy, strange? Good. Is it unfinished? Good. I can help you with that too. I can work with you to find actors, musicians, and voiceover artists and quickly realise your projects. I get practice making the shows and you get a finished, performed and published version of your writing. Save yourself the hassle and the headache of making your podcasts on your own by working with me instead.